So here we go. We are going to. Is that door locked or unlocked? I thought it, it was. Locked. It's locked. Mm -hmm. Oh my. Okay. Let's see what I can do to fix that. My apologies. If you should arrive late one of these days and the door is locked, please do knock. My I wish this uh, to have everybody here. Certainly, we'll not uh, keep you standing out in the, in the hallway. But it turns for me, so. I don't feel like you're going to be locked out intentionally. Here's where we left off uh, last class with the Mississippian period having gotten underway. Corn arrived from Central America in the morning and uh, transformed those southeastern Native American communities. They uh, stopped all the hunting and gathering and uh, began developing into more complex societies, which I described as chieftains, one of the basic forms of human society. And we looked at some archaeology here in North Georgia, which shows you in more detail a little bit later from the Edoa Mound site, and theorized about what it might mean the cranial deformation for those buried inside the mounds. Uh, some of you thought maybe that was a sign of setting them apart. That's what archaeologists think more varied diet for those who were buried within the mounds. So the portrait that emerges from the archaeology is one of a stratified society, not a democracy, not a egalitarian society, but a stratified society with an elite class apparently in control. And you guys have now an eyewitness glimpse of that society from DeSoto, who we'll talk about in just a moment uh, when we get to that. that uh, travel that uh, expedition through South Carolina. Well, the Mississippian era for Southeastern Indians was moving towards more complex societies, but history had other ideas. Here are the three ships of Columbus's original voyage making the way, reconstructions of course, taking the way across the Atlantic in 1492. I put the date up here because I think you guys as history majors, or people interested in history, already have that one under your belt. But my freshmen, oftentimes, uh, they don't learn the old nursery rhyme, 1492, Columbus sailed with the ocean blue. All my generation knew that by heart. But sometimes some of my freshmen struggle a little bit with 1492. For some of them, it appears to be just a date like any other. It's not built into their DNA as it has been for many generations. But uh, 1492, uh, the Spaniards arrived. And a few notable milestones. They set up camp in uh, the Caribbean and began exploiting what they had discovered. Columbus, of course, was hoping to find China and Japan bumped into the Americas instead, so made the best of it by enslaving large numbers of people in the Caribbean and conquering the Aztec Empire, 1519 to 1521. And of course, uh, everybody knows about the 1521 visit to Chicora. It's a, it's a, a lame joke. Nobody, nobody knows about the visit to Chicora. It's one of the most forgotten moments in uh, American history, but it brings us right to Carolina. Not yet called Carolina, the Spanish were referring to it as Chicora uh, because uh, they had encountered it, and that's the word that seemed to be referring to, to the land. There is a Spanish map from a little bit later, but pretty close to our time period. You have Columbus's base of operations down here, Hispaniola. Let me get my laser pointer going. There's Hispaniola and Santa Domingo, from which most everything the, the Spaniards did in terms of exploration originated. They uh, 
enslaved, as I said, the Arawak and Taino indigenous population of that island and worked them virtually to, extin to extinction. Began launching slave raids to other islands. And uh, initially, when they contacted our region, thought it was likely an island because almost everything they bumped into was an island in the Caribbean. Only a little bit later did they connect the dots and realize it was a, a solid coastline up there. But they made contact with the coast of Carolina and the word the natives appeared to be using to the Spaniards when they first uh, encountered it was Chicora. So they referred to it as the land of Chicora. It's written on the map there, Chicora. They uh, came in to the coast of Carolina, I'm not sure of the exact location. I'm not sure the Spaniards recorded it, but uh, had a friendly exchange with Native Americans, uh, gave them some beads and other trinkets and so on, and purchased some skins, and then invited them aboard the ship to take a look around. The Native, Native Americans were curious about the ship. While they were on board the ship, they pulled up the anchor and slowly began moving off. I can imagine their friends and family on shore, thinking it was just kind of part of the fun afternoon activity, waving back and forth as they got farther and farther and farther and farther out to sea and ultimately all the way back to Hispaniola where they were enslaved and put to work on gold and silver. One of them uh, began to learn some Spanish and communicated with uh, Spanish officials, and they were curious about Chicora, how many more people are up there in Chicora that can be taken on a fun ocean journey of this nature. Uh, and uh, Lucas Ayon, Lucas Vasquez de Ayon began to really listen and become intrigued by some of these stories, the information coming from uh, the young man, he was given the name Francisco, called Francisco de Chicora. He was one of those Indians who was invited aboard ship and then taken down and enslaved in Hispaniola, Francisco of Chicora. But uh, I all listened to Francisco and became intrigued. He was thinking maybe it would be a good place not only to kidnap additional slaves from, but also perhaps to establish a colony so they could explore the countryside. And this era, this is only about uh, seven years after the Aztec, the Spanish assumption was there were lots of those Aztec empires out there. So ambitious young men like Ayon wanted to go out and establish bases from which they could explore or launch expeditions. Pizarro did it. South America, wham, immediately he ran into the Incan Empire. He had gold and silver jewels pouring into his pockets. So they were all thinking, it's got to be more out there. Just have to go out and explore. That's what Soto was doing, wandering through Tofa to Chucky in 1540. So based on that information, and he took uh, Francisco with him on the journey, he organized a colonizing expedition, first European attempt at colonizing a region we now call Carolina. And he named it the catchy title of San Miguel de Guadalupe. Around, I'm not sure if archeologists, I don't think they have identified the exact location where they attempted it, but just about Winyaw Bay, a little bit north of Charleston, South Carolina, South Carolina they, they landed and attempted, they built a few dwellings, a fort, as best as they could, but nothing went right on that, that expedition. They quarreled among themselves, fell ill. They had brought, uh, I believe, smallpox and a number of other diseases along with them from Hispaniola, so they began to die of epidemic disease. Their, Supplies ran short, uh, supply ships sank, and 
it turned into an absolute disaster. In the end, the survivors began walking. They had no idea exactly where they were going. They knew Hispaniola was kind of to the southward down there in the Caribbean, so they just began staggering in that direction down past what we now call Savannah, almost down to uh, Sapelo, Sapelo Island, where they did, the survivors did make contact with, uh, they saw a Spanish ship out there and flagged it down. And I believe maybe a hundred or even less were finally rescued from an original colonizing expedition of about 600, 500 to 600. So it was a, a complete disaster. But it shows up. This too shows up in our assigned reading. If you remember the DeSoto narrative, there's a little, little uh, glimpse of, uh, of this. You can talk about it if you want to when we get there. And here is a second attempt. This is the, the gentleman, the chronicle of his journey that you read as your activity online. Fernando de Soto, much like other Spanish explorers, was convinced that there was another glittering empire, Aztec or Incan empire out there. So he, he wanted to explore the southeast. He gathered up in the neighborhood of 600 conquistadors, armed Spaniards. He wasn't alone, it was happening. Coronado, uh, who is the originator of the, fade, uh, the famous Seven Cities of Gold myth. He was exploring the Southwest, and of course those waves of heat on the desert, he thought he saw way off in the distance seven, seven domes of gold or something of that nature, but he just didn't have the water to, to make it across the desert. Uh, but uh, De Soto uh, thought surely there was another Aztec empire in the southeast, and uh, he began making his way. Entered around Tampa, Florida, made his way northward through what is today Disney World. up through Georgia, then a little bit eastward, almost exactly through where we are currently sitting. Uh, his expedition of 600 conquistadors would have been only 10 to 15 miles to either side of us, maybe, right, right through this area. They had uh, an immense Not sure what you call a lot of hogs. They had brought a lot of old boars. Not a modern pig, but a kind of the ancestral version of a pig as part of their food supply. Hundreds and hundreds uh, when they embarked here and they bred and bred. So they were almost more, there were more and more of those wild boars, not wild yet, but they began to splinter off from the expedition. If you're a hunter and you've ever encountered a boar out in out in the, the woods, there's a chance it's the descendant of one of those boars that seeded the southeast as they made their way through. And right here, close to modern day Columbia, South Carolina, they encountered Pofa de Chucky. They had encountered others before. Let's see. Yes. I showed you on day one a little mound uh, I helped excavate as a, a younger man. That was at Okupe, right about there. Here is Popa the Chucky. And the excerpt you read, the letters are kind of transposed, the T and the F. Typically, most historians call it Popa the Chucky rather than Kota, Kota the Chucky. Um, but, uh, I'm going to stop for just a moment and talk a little bit about that encounter. Does the glimpse of that chieftain that you read seem to confirm some of the archaeological clues that we looked at, some of the ideas that we had looking at the archaeology? I see a couple of people saying yes. 
I've only processed about five of your essays so far, uh, but uh, don't think I know the people who, uh, who I read. But uh, we're dealing with a female ruler, right? Would you say she was just one of the one of the guys in Kofita Cheki? I see you saying you know, shaking your head no, but let's get it out in the open. Why why does she appear to be something else than just an ordinary person? She's carried around in a chair. Yeah, pretty big. The person who gets carried around in a chair usually appears is uh, sets them apart. In a number of ways. So she's so special, she doesn't even hit the ground. She has attendants who carry her on a litter with pillows on the litter wherever she goes. Did anything in that excerpt strike you as interesting or worthy of some thought? I thought that you know, um, specifically women didn't have a major role in society. But in this tribe, you know, he was the one who spoke to the, I believe he was called the governor. They referred to DeSoto as the governor. Yeah. Yeah. In part, uh, that is, the, if I go back to his, uh, I guess I can do it safely in just a moment. No, it won't let me go back from. If you go to that image of, I showed you the portrait of him, it says Adelan Tado at the top. That's, that's the governor. It, Basically, as a title, it uh, means uh, the, pr the, the proposal for him was if he could establish control of this entire region, it was his. If he could control it and find some use for it, he's the Adelantado, the governor of it. So he's marching through trying to find some stuff. I'm sorry, I, I ran, ran away with your, your mention of the title, the governor, but you're, you're talking about in Spanish society, women were rarely in that kind of position of leadership. The Spanish were a patriarchal society. And typically, we are today, there's a difference between patriarchal, where men are in control in a position of power, and patrilineal. Have you heard the term patrilineal? We are a patrilineal, maybe we're a little, still a little bit patri patriarchal. We're celebrating our first ever uh, woman vice president. So that suggests that men have had a little bit of a privileged position. Uh, but patrilineal has to do with uh, family lineage. Even in my family, uh, we consider ourselves enlightened and my wife kept her name, uh, but our children took my name because typically that's the way we do it and we kind of felt comfortable with that. But Patrilineal means the name comes through the father's line. Uh, most southeastern Indian nations, when records began to be taken, when Europeans encountered them and were recording names and traditions, that sort of thing, were matrilineal. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean they were matriarchal, but they were matrilineal. The family lineage descended through the mother. And that really it takes a little thinking about the, the practical ramifications of that, because uh, in these types of societies, the father, in fact, there is virtually no relation to the child. And in many of these societies was not given very much say in the rearing of the child. It was the mother, the mother's brother, the, the mother's relations. So. Having a female ruler here uh, kind of fits in with what we know about later uh, Southeastern Indian cultures, that they were matrilineal, so she may have been in that ruling lineage and it came to her. But most of the, uh, most of the uh, you didn't see it in your excerpt, most of the, re the, the rulers he came across were male. So this may be an indication that in this location, she. Either there was not a male heir in the lineage or she was simply preferred, I don't know. But it was not unheard of. We're not gonna talk about them very much, but one of the earliest expeditions to scout out the colony of South Carolina came across another female ruler down close to Hilton Head. Uh, 
and she was the one who welcomed uh, Sir William Hilton and uh, talked to him about what he was planning to do. So it was not unusual at all. Anything else strike you as uh, as worthy of consideration? Yes. Um, it was kind of confusing at first because I was reading and it seemed like they were giving over too easily, in my opinion. And then at the end, it seemed like it was all a trick. Like, a ruse. So like they're they're very clever with like they must have heard word or something or encountered them before, so they kind of knew how to work them. You know, with the gold and the jewel type thing. And... Yeah. They had probably heard he was coming and that was the first thing he always asked about where is the gold <laughs> do you have gold and usually by the time he got up into these uh, into the Appalachian Mountains typically the people he was encountering knew that he was not all that fun to have around and what he was looking for so usually they would say oh yes there is there's a fabulously valuable kingdom farther down the trail we're it's not us we don't have you know, anything of real value but boy if you keep going uh, about 50 miles down the trail, you will encounter lots and lots of gold and and so on. So he was convinced it was out there because they kept telling him, you know, it's over there. Uh, but you say they kind of gave up a little bit easily. But I feel like it was intentional though with that, like tricking. Uh, maybe tricking them a little bit. There's one kind of, uh, there's so much in that excerpt we can talk about. We don't have time, but uh, when she first Meets. What did you think about that greeting, where she says, "Welcome to your country. I've just been holding it for you." <laughs> Isn't that a little bit over the top? Uh, strangely enough, Montezuma said the same thing when Cortez arrived in 1519 in Tenochtitlan. Have you ever heard that Spanish saying, "Mi casa"? My house is your house. So it's likely a greeting. It doesn't mean that she's really giving him the whole chiefdom, but she, it's, a, it's a nicety. And this is the way the Spaniards translated it into their own language. Welcome to your country, your home away from home. And it gets translated that way. Uh, a few people mentioned uh, the abandoned town. What did you think, of that? Let's think about that? They arrive in Copa de Chequi. They're welcomed in this grand manner by the lady of Copa de Chequi, the ruler who never touches the ground. And then they uh, they encounter that abandoned town. One person, uh, I think, theorized it might have been some plague or disease. That's one of the most famous passages in southeastern historical literature. Historians and archaeologists have gone back and forth across those pages you read, considering that paradigm, because it may be the very first evidence of disease making its way into the southeast, an entire town that's been depopulated. In fact, that they don't go to. Uh, and they discover the dagger. Some European merchandise suggesting that maybe Copa de Chequi had somehow or another encountered that diseased colony of Ione down there in 1526. So historians have speculated this may be the very first disease vector heading into the south, that from Ione's colony, smallpox may have made its way up to Copa de Chequi, resulting in that abandoned town, which suggests it was on its way into the interior of the southeast very early. Uh, and it did awful damage. Native Americans, same thing in the Caribbean and Central America, but they had very few immunities or antibodies, no medical history of how to deal with smallpox, a whole range of other diseases making their way into the Americas at that time. There were virtually no, or very few known epidemic diseases among Native Americans prior to the arrival of Europeans. They brought in a real cocktail of, of deadly viruses. Smallpox, the worst, even among Europeans who had seen it for generations and generations, it had a death rate of around 40%. An awful, awful way to die. I don't know how much you know about smallpox. 
But for populations that had never seen it before, uh, the mortality rate was far above, far above that. So that passage has really been a, a subject of study for historians, the depopulated town with evidence of contact with the Spanish on the coast down there. Maybe the first uh, evidence of disease. If it's not, uh, De Soto took care of it himself because some of his soldiers had smallpox when they landed down at Tampa. And as you can see, he made it a point to go to every population center in the south all the way out to Texas. So he took smallpox with them everywhere. And, uh, and the, you'll see the result in just a moment. A few people mentioned the kind of park-like appearance of the countryside. The Spaniards commented on the beautiful countryside. And that was likely a managed landscape. In historic times, Native Americans practiced controlled burns to create habitat for white-tailed deer, openings and edge habitat so that it would maximize that population and so on. So they were probably looking at not a primeval forest, but a managed landscape that was intended to produce certain things for the sustenance of the chiefdom. And then the escape. Almost everybody's essay I read about talked about that escape with the box of pearls. The Spaniards had collected those pearls. They were the ones looking. They didn't have any gold, but they went to around and collected those pearls as best they could. And uh, why was uh, the casica? Did you come across that term? And this passage. That's what Spaniards mm. typically call her. That's an Arawak word from Hispaniola. Uh, a male ruler would be a cacique. And uh, you'll see next week when we establish Carolina, the large proprietors created that as a social rank title in South Carolina. But she was uh, referred to as the cacica. Why was she traveling with them on to the next chieftain? Yeah, this is uh, this is also something the Spaniards did almost everywhere. This is why Montezuma was killed. The Spaniards took him captive too because he was the leader. The Spanish discovered early on that if they simply captured the leader of whatever culture they were trying to exploit, that was much easier than trying to subdue everybody. So they captured Montezuma and they had him try to order people to do things, but they captured the casica. They took her. She didn't want to provide them with burden or people to carry things. And she certainly didn't want to go south. But, uh, they took her, they kidnapped her. Or, let, or I haven't hit on the correct verb just yet. They, they took her into custody, maybe is the best way to say it, because they wanted her to give orders wherever they went as they went out of her kingdom to supply them with corn, food, have people carry their baggage and ammunition, so on. And uh, she was obeyed. So there's another indication of what kind of power. You know, we have the initial indication she's something special because she's carried on the litter. But in practical terms, wherever they took her, it, was, it worked quite well. People did exactly what she said as soon as she said it. They brought out the supplies, they supplied the men to carry the baggage for the Spaniards and so on. So that too gives her a, gives us a sense of what kind of power as a chief she was uh, exercising. And we have a pretty good indication of the limit of that. So we're traveling northward. But uh, she escapes in the end. This is one of the the great mysteries of Southern history, nobody knows anymore. That's where she steps out of the picture, steps out of the spotlight. She managed to arrange her escape by pretending to need to do something private. And uh, cleverly 
took that box of pearls along with her and, uh, and made her way back. We don't know if she made it back to Copa de Cheque. We don't know what the rest of her life was like. But that tantalizing suggestion at the end, when the messenger comes in to De Soto and suggests that uh, it was believed she was going back with one of the escaped slaves from the expedition. The expedition had a lot of baggage. And I don't know if it's someone they had enslaved while marching through or someone who had been enslaved in Hispaniola and brought uh, but the messenger suggested there was some type of romantic relationship between the Casica and that slave as they made their escape back to back to Kofa to Chequi. So more you want to talk about on that with that document? I won't dwell on it too long, but it's uh, chock full, chock full of insights about the Mississippian period. Well. There's the entire route of the DeSoto expedition, and uh, the results were not good for southeastern Indians. On our first slide of the presentation, I have the date range for the Mississippian period, about 900 AD to 1550 or 1540 AD, and this is why it ends. 1550 AD, the De Soto expedition. De Soto didn't attack Kofa de Chequi, but he had plenty of military conflict with other chiefdoms as he marched throughout the southeast. And uh, the result of that military conflict, and more likely the result of the smallpox that he left in his wake everywhere went other diseases, resulted in the destabilization of most of those chiefdoms. So they collapsed. And you can see it archaeologically in a number of ways. In fact, when cotton planters came in many, many years later, uh, the, the slaves, oftentimes, the wives clearing the, the fields to plant cotton. Let's see, Alabama and Mississippi came under cotton cultivation about 1830s. Yeah, 1830s, 1820s, 1830s, and those slaves cutting down oak trees. They were, they were, cotton was so desperately desired, they even cut down the oak trees on the top. So those temple mounds, you know, to plant cotton on top of the temple mound. And uh, the slave said, uh, whoever built these mounds stopped using them about 300 years ago because they cut down the, the oak tree and they counted the rings. 300. So whoever built them, went away, or stopped, or did something, or died, they knew, you know, historians didn't know, but the slave laborers, laborers on those plantations knew, because the, whoever was using the plantation, the, the temple mountain stopped using them. 1550s. So the chiefs stopped living up there. They stopped adding layers in the 1550s, and the chiefdoms began to disintegrate the end, end of the, the Mississippian era. So after two failed efforts, Ione's disastrous attempt on the coast and uh, De Soto's disastrous expedition. And by the way, he died ultimately. They lost all of their gunpowder, all of their cannons, all of their steel weapons and were marching with wooden spears toward the end. And uh, he died and his body was rolled into the Mississippi. But uh, why would the Spanish still be interested? They weren't for its own sake. They knew by this point there was no Aztec empire in there. There was no gold, known source of gold later on Miners discovered gold in Georgia, but that's in the 1830s. There was nothing they really wanted, but uh, they had massive quantities of gold coming out of Central America, from the Aztec Empire and the Inca Empire. They sailed at home. 
means of the Gulf Stream, this red current you see there is the Gulf Stream, a warm water current, as you probably know, that travels about three to five miles per hour. So if you're headed back to Europe, it's exactly the thing you need. You just park your boat right there and the current, even if the wind's not blowing, the current will drive you, carry you three to five miles per hour right back, right back home. Carries you up into the trade winds and then you can catch the wind and head on back to Europe. So all of that gold and silver was traveling exactly along that route. Here we are, here we are in Carolina. So Spaniards were concerned and thinking about uh, this part of the country, mostly because uh, they knew there were some pirates out there interested in that gold and silver. If you're a pirate, you didn't have to think too deeply about it. You knew exactly where the treasure was going to be going. If you posted yourself anywhere along this coast, it was going to float right to you. So that's what they did. Here are a couple of the first, a couple of French Protestants. They had a hard time in France because France was a Roman Catholic country, an intolerant country. And uh, they were looking for other opportunities. Piracy, attacking the Catholic treasure ships was, was one of those attractive possibilities. So they uh, established a base of operations, coast of Carolina. not yet called Carolina. It was still referred to as La Florida, Spanish term for it. Around Port Royal, they built a little fort and the whole purpose of it was to launch out and seize those treasure ships as they floated past and become rich. So for that reason, word got down to Hispaniola. The Spanish were aware that the, these two pirates, Ribot and Laudanier, were doing that. And for that reason, they started to think maybe it would be a good idea to go ahead and establish some type of colony in La Florida to make sure they can wipe out, you know, scrub the coast of the, of the pirates. There is their little fort. For many years, it was not, there was, well, let me say it this way. For many years, archeologists didn't know exactly where it was. They knew it was somewhere around Port Royal. Uh, but about 10 years ago, they identified it on Paris Island and have begun doing some excavations. So now it's a, a targeted uh, study. But uh, they built a little fort called Charles Fort about 1562 and three. And uh, once the Spaniards realized that there was an actual fort, uh, they really accelerated their plans to fortify, their own plans to fortify Florida. Here's the man they tagged for the job, Pedro Menendez. He too was given the same title, Atlantado. Atlantado, Florida. It's a pretty flexible term. He could do almost whatever he wanted. They didn't want to ask questions as long as he was able to control it militarily, keep those pirates out, he was able to mine gold, silver, exploit resources, exploit the indigenous population in any, any fashion he uh, considered appropriate. And they would not uh, put too many restraints on him. What they wanted was a pirate-free coast for those treasure ships to make, make their way back home. So he established St. Augustine annual spring break destination in the days before the pandemic, 1565. And he began organizing his men. He didn't have a huge number, but he had more than the pirates up there at uh, Port Royal in organizing them for a surgical strike to wipe out Charles Fort. Ribot knew about that and he decided to make the first move. He gathered up his pirates, they got on board a ship, 
sailed down to attack Menendez in 1565. But a storm blew up, capsized the boat. Uh, the French pirates had to swim best as they could up onto the beaches just south of St. Augustine. Can I have a volunteer to do a historical reenactment? This will be one of the most amazing historical reenactments you've ever seen. If I can get one volunteer. You have to die, of course, but <laughs> to be John Rebo. All right. No historical reenactment. Do you want the reenactment without participant? <laughs> Nobody wants to, prefer to be Jean Ribot. I'll do it. <laughs> it's an easy role. You can stay exactly right where you are. Uh, it, it would be good if you don't have to, but if you could kind of put your hands together and say, s'il vous plaît, s'il vous plaît, please, please. S'il vous plaît. <laughs> Well, Jean Ribot and uh, his pirates, of course, they had to toss their armor off and swim as best they could to get up onto the beach. And uh, maybe 40, 50 of them gathered up there. They had, their powder was all wet. They had lost their weapons. Uh, they were dripping wet, cold, he surrounded. Pedro Menendez rode down there with the soldiers, soldiers and surrounded them as they crouched there on the sand. He walked up to Jean Ribot, and Jean Ribot said, Begging for mercy, begging for mercy. Pedro Mendez drew his sword and ran into So at this point, if it were really a spectacular reenactment, Kaylee? Kaylee would slump to the floor and maybe roll around. But then the rest of the soldiers moved in and they they wiped them out. So if you go down there for spring break, it's Kansas. Word for master, a little beach in Matanzas to the south of St. Augustine is where they wiped out the, the pirates. Killed the pirates. Killed them flat out dead. So, he was a little more successful in establishing control of the South than De Soto had been, and he was successful in scrubbing the coast. He got rid of the pirates big time and kept them gone, which is all that the Spanish were really asking of, uh, of Menendez. But after that, he had a rather difficult time figuring out what to do with his new domain. There wasn't any gold or silver he could find. Uh, and he had a little trouble dominating the, the Native American population of the region, even distressed as they were. Remember, the Mississippian period was in shambles, collapsing at this point. The old chiefdoms, the order of command was coming apart. They were refugees, smallpox, destroying populations. The, the Native Americans of the region were in a sorry condition. But even so, he had a rather difficult time establishing control. What they finally came up with as a way of influencing and drawing Native Americans into their camp was religion. Sent some Franciscan missionaries out. Initially, they tried the Jesuits. The Jesuits were a little bit too high-handed. They wanted everybody to do exactly what they wanted to do, and Native Americans cut their arms off. So they went back and said, no, that, that doesn't work. Uh, so they, chose, they went with the, the Franciscan order, and the Franciscans were very creative. They learned Native American languages, in some cases took Native American names themselves to try and you know, get to know people. And, and they began to spread the Christian message about the Southeast and establish missions. And they were quite successful. They got their start around the 1580s. 
And by the mid 1600s, they had really transformed uh, the lower south. They had established many, many mission chapels. That's what these little red church symbols are, individual chapels, missions, mission complexes that would be comprised of the, the chapel itself with a church bell. Uh, basic requirements for the Native Americans was they had to create their cornfields close enough to hear the bell, somewhere close enough to the chapel to hear the bell, and on Sundays when they heard it ringing, come to the Mass, to hear the Mass and receive the Eucharist, all that kind of stuff, in exchange for which they got some European merchandise. The, the Franciscans never, never gave them guns. But uh, they gave them steel knives and hatchets, things that were really useful for chopping down trees and doing other types of work. And there was kind of a promise, an implicit promise, that if the individuals converted to Christianity, it might provide them some refuge from those awful pestilences. Nobody knew to say smallpox, probably. There was some hope that conversion to Christianity spare them, give them some of the immunities that the immunities. The Europeans themselves appeared to have. By the mid-1600s, there were over 25,000 Native Americans living in those mission complexes. The, the friars themselves were not armed and they didn't have a military backup. At best, a priest serving here might have four soldiers within a 50 mile distance. Uh, but then mostly he was out there by himself. So if he got roughed up or disrespected, he would have to send a message to four soldiers. It would be several days before they got there. And even when they got there, there would only be four. That's not enough to really intimidate 100 or 200 warriors. So it was, uh, it was uh, it's possible to question how genuine the conversions to Christianity were. It was kind of a mutual benefit arrangement, but it was a pretty significant movement. If you were looking at the South at that moment, you might be tempted to say that was the wave of the future. It appeared, it appeared that the collapse of the chiefdoms was leading to a new reorganization of life into these mission, mission complexes. You almost certainly would have said that appears to be where things are going in the Southeast. But again, history stepped in way up north. This is a story too complex to tell entirely, but it's also too bizarre not to tell in some detail. Way up north, you guys probably know the Iroquois or the Great Lakes. It's Iroquois country right under the Great Lakes there, the five nations. I don't think I can name them. Onondaga, the Mohawk, Seneca, the Oneida. And one more, it'll come to me in just a moment. But the Five Nations, they were kind of the driving engine of a, a broad process. They were dying like everyone else as a result of smallpox and other diseases, but they replenished their population by means of warfare. They got their hands on European guns. They attacked their neighbors on all sides and took children and raised them up to believe they were Iroquois. So while everyone else was declining in numbers, the Iroquois miraculously stayed powerful. Now they did it by cannibalizing, not eating, but actual, you know, by taking. So there were victims, lots of refugees and victims moving out away from Iroquois, trying to get away from the Iroquois. They were relentless in their quest for power, hunting ground so they could secure beaver pelts and other types of furs to buy the guns and then war to bring new blood into the nation to maintain their, their power. Well, there was a little group up there, uh, a 
I believe way up there they might have been called the, the Ricka Hawkins, but uh, by the time they get to our part of the country, they were known as West Oos. West O Indian Nation. And they just began running for it. They had been hammered. Their kids had been captured. They had been decimated. And they just wanted to get the heck out of Dodge. So they began moving southward. Let me see if I can draw their path of retreat. Away, run away, down to Virginia where they did their best to make a new home for themselves. Uh, they were a bedraggled little nation of maybe a little more than 150 warriors. Uh, and uh, they did their best on the frontiers of Virginia to establish themselves and fight off enemies. They tried their best to get some guns and tried to attack others as they had been attacked. It just didn't work out very well. They weren't powerful enough. They continued to be victimized. Uh, members, and there, uh, the issue of slavery comes up. Virginia was in the early stages of tobacco agriculture. They were desperate for slave labor. So Westos were captured. And here, they weren't incorporated into the Iroquois. They were sold into slavery. And the Westos reciprocated by taking captives where they could and selling them for a gun to the Virginia tobacco planters selling the captive as a slave. But uh, uh, they just didn't have the numbers to really hold their own. So once again, with that sad, sad face, they retreated further southward and set up camp on the Savannah River around Augusta, Georgia. By that time, they had barely 100, maybe down to only 60 warriors. They were not a, a numerous nation. But here is, your, here is your exercise for the day. And we're going to talk about it very briefly afterwards. But imagine you can either work by yourself or with someone else, as long as you maintain social distance. Um, imagine that you are one of those Westo Indians. They arrived down here on the uh, Savannah River as refugees about 1650s. You've now entered a region in which the old Mississippi period chiefdoms have collapsed. There are a lot of refugees trying to make their way. You've got uh, the Spanish missions set up along the coast of Georgia and South Carolina, along northern Florida. None of those Indians as guns. So for the moment, the Westos have a chance to take a breath, think about what they're going to do next. And that's the, that's the problem. Consider the scenario, what do you do? You've been chased all the way down the east coast. Now what? Right, maybe a paragraph. If you know what happens, don't go online and look it up. But if you know what happens, you're welcome to just go ahead and do that. But the intention is, uh, folks who don't know the full story, uh, think about how it's mind killed. What stories are mind killed? What those have made at this stage of the game? So lots of different options open to them. Again, recording again. Here is the sad truth about the Westos. Something happened to them. Not only did they engage in a lot of conflict and captive taking and enslavement and violence all the way down, but in the process, something happened. I think this is the only way to explain it. Something happened to them. They weren't normal. They weren't normal anymore by the time they got to the Savannah River. They were something something off about the Westos. They attacked, like you, like you said. Seeing the opportunity, a lot of unarmed 
victims all around them. Their first thought was not to establish a home, not to be comfortable, not to make allies and friends, but to victimize, to do what they saw the Iroquois. Does it just repeat? Almost, I think there must be a psychological uh, study about this of how victims become victimizers. In some cases, those who experience horrible things as children you know, deserve pity, but in some cases also grow up to act out. Um, the the Westos, having experienced all of that, uh, did it, and they were uh, not just once or were in a while to to make ends meet. Uh, they were, I think it's fair to say, pathological at this point. Uh, it was almost incessant. They made war on everyone they could lay hands on. And they went all the way down to the coast of Georgia to those little chapels. There's one uh, on Saint Simon's. They went all the way down to St. Simon's and attacked those poor church-going agricultural Indians who had nothing but some knives and hatchets. And the guns turned out to be pretty darn defective. Uh, with those guns, they, uh, they maybe were energized for once by having that level of power for everybody, but they, they really put it to work. Uh, they captured people and marched them all the way up to Virginia to sell for more guns. So those Indian captives were marched up to Virginia and sold into slavery, either worked on, went to work on the tobacco plantations or were shipped out to other slave colonies. And the, uh, the Westos developed a reputation as uh, real terrorists. Everyone who encountered them in the Southeast, when the first Carolinians came in 1670, and uh, the first expeditions to explore the coast in the 1660s, all of the coastal Indians talked about the Westos. It's, it's a horrifying, horrifying thing. Yeah, what, is what they were doing on the Savannah worse than what they were doing in Virginia, or was it somewhat similar? Well, it was, uh, it was different in a couple of different ways. The Westos were much smaller in scale. Uh, the Iroquois were immense. Uh, the Iroquois level of devastation. There was a French exploration party going down the Mississippi River here. And they encountered uh, about a mile wide swath of corpses, a community, community that had been wiped out by Iroquois raiders. Think about that level of that's, I mean, even in a car on an interstate, that would take you a day and a half. That's, that's a huge distance there. The Iroquois were immense. So on the, on the levels of scale of magnitude, the Westos, they were a tiny little group. Uh, and they were doing a little to, something different. The Iroquois were trying to bulk up their manpower to replenish themselves from epidemic disease. The Westos... Were, were fully and consciously, knowingly pioneering the Indian slave trade. This is, this is warfare for the purpose of taking human beings for sale into slavery. So in, that, in, that, in that sense, it's not just self-preservation, it's the willingness to victimize others, knowing exactly what they were doing. Um, so there was something a little off about the Westos. Uh, they uh, deserve credit, if we can call it that, for pioneering an Indian slave trade in the South. But the more guns they got, the more powerful they were, and the more powerful they were, the more captives, the more war they made, and they really began to hammer the Spanish missions. Let's stop there. And, uh, we'll set up Carolina next week. Keep in mind, you're right.